All right, our next speaker is Sally Abishroon. She's a PhD student and uh, earned her master's and bachelor's of science degrees from Jordan University of Science and Technology. She's currently studying at Clarkson's University, Clarkson University's Center for Air and Aquatic Resource Engineering Science. It's a mouthful. Um, her research includes working with the Great Lakes Fish Monitoring and Surveillance Program, which monitors the quality of the Great Lakes ecosystem. Please join me in welcoming Sally. Okay, good morning all. Today I will talk about part of the Great Lake Fish uh, Monitoring and Surveillance Program funded by the EPA, which basically monitor the contaminants in uh, the top predator fish of the Great Lakes. As we all know, the Great Lakes are important for the whole world because they are one of the largest uh, source of fresh water worldwide. As for the U.S., they contain 84% of the fresh surface water in the U.S. And they provide water for over 30 million people living in the U.S. and Canada, not to mention the other animals, the trees, and the other plants around it. Unfortunately for us, there are many threats affecting the ecosystem of the Great Lakes and the river. Uh, for example, agricultural activities, which uh, include the use of pesticides, the use of insecticides, and these uh, compound, carcinogenic compounds, will leach into the soil, which will leach into the water. Uh, we have uh, industrial activities, which could directly pose into the, the water, leach into the water, or contaminate the air also which when the rain come, the air con in contact with the water, all will go to the water. We have landfill, leachate, we have domestic activities. We even have natural disasters like wildfires. Not to mention the ships that have cargo that could also leak into the body of water. So we have various sources that could lead into contamination to the body of water. So, and we chose top predator fish because fish are, uh, can, could get these contaminants either directly from the water or from the aquatic plant, uh, from eating other fish, from sands, from many sources. And then top predator fish will take it all. So top predator fish will give us an over, overall view of the contaminants or of the quality of the ecosystem in the Great Lakes. So one of the major contaminants we're interested in are halogenated organic contaminants. And halogenated means uh, com contaminants that contain either chlorine or bromine functional groups or a mix of them. Uh, examples of uh, legacy contaminants that contain bromine and uh, chlorine are Bromochloropesticides, uh, polychloropesticide, oh, thank you, which we can find in uh, electronics, organochloropesticides, which we can find in pesticides and insecticides, polybrominated diphenyl ethers, which are flame retardants. And we care about this group of contaminants because they are uh, persistent, bioaccumulative, and toxic. But in our line of work, we don't concentrate only on these known legacy contaminants. We look for all halogenated contaminants because all of them could have the same profile as these contaminants. So what we do basically is non-targeted analysis of halogenated organic contaminants. But first, let's explain. So targeted means looking for something in this. So we have a sample, complicated people on the beach, and we're looking for Waldo, just one single compound or known compounds that we know what they are. So we filter everything and we only take Waldo. But when we do non-targeted analysis, it's more of looking at everyone on the beach. So imagine a police officer going to one by one, checking the IDs, seeing if anyone would record. So that's exactly what we do. We look at everyone, everything there in the fish. 
And the importance of non-targeted analysis is that the concentration of unknown halogenated compounds that we found a lot higher than the concentration of the legacy contaminants. And this makes sense because the legacy contaminants were banned. So their concentration is getting lower and lower, but they transform inside the environment. And also they could fragment, could, they could give us unknown results. And this is not just it, but also the industry will come always with a new compounds because the previous one were banned. So what we do exactly is first we get around 50 uh, fish from each lake separated. We homogenize them. We extract the organic matter and we do some cleanup just to remove the lipids and fatty acids. Then we inject the sample into advanced gas chromatography instrument. Then we get like around 10,000 compound in each sample that we need to identify each one of them. So just a glimpse of what gas chromatography means. So we have a very, very long, thin tube uh, column. So it's like 30 meter. We inject the sample into the column and we have temperature ramp. So at low temperature, the volatile compound will start to elute then the least volatile when we increase the temperature will start to elute as well. So we can separate the compounds. So here each peak in the chromatogram represents a compound. So we separate the compounds based on the, their volatility. But when we are talking about fish sample, complex sample, this is actually what we see. No separation at all. So another way to explain that is imagine these compounds are people running on a marathon. And if you have only one column, which is only 1D, one dimension, you can only separate people who have different speed, who are running on a different speed. But if you have a second dimension, you'll be able to see people who run on the same speed, i.e. when we're talking about compounds, they are compounds with the same volatility, let's say, or, or the same properties. So that's why we use two-dimensional gas chromatography, because this is the white here, look at this peak. If we had only this one dimension, we would have thought that these three compounds, because each mountain could represent a compound here. So we would have thought that all these three compounds are one in one dimension, but they were separated in our second dimension. So after separating these 10,000 compounds, we need to identify them. So they enter into a mass spectrometer, which give us the mass of the compound and some fragments that are exclusive for each compound. So they act like a fingerprints. And we have a library that contains uh, over 300,000 standard mass spectrometer of compounds. So we can match it to it just exactly like matching fingerprints. So the, here is the standards from the library and it will tell us like, for example, there's 94% match between the compound you found and the standard. So we can identify what the compound is. But because we look at unknowns and transformation of compound that we know, I could say like 90% of the compound we have do not have any match in the library. <laughs> so this is what we get, unfortunately. So in that case, we need to look at the highest mass because this mass will uh, represent the mass of the compound. And what we do after that is we go to a program and tell it, please, uh, tell us what the combination of element that will give us this exact mass. So from there, they will just com combine uh, hydrogen, chlorine, whatever they want, just to give us this exact mass. And from some knowledge of chemistry, we can find the right formula of the compound. And by also some knowledge of the fr fragmentation, we can get an idea of the, the, the structure of the compounds. 
Also, unfortunately for us, the ionization uh, method that we use to get these mass spectra sometimes only give us fragments. So, so the molecule will just break down and we will not see the most important mass. <laughs> and it's just like getting a partial finger fingerprint where that will not help you with that. And what happened? Without getting another information. So what we do in that case is what we decided to do is, is we decided to run the samples on also another different ionization technique that will give us exclusively the molecular ion. So before doing that, we had this unknown, for example, and we thought that since this is the highest uh, mass, it will represent the mass of the compound. But we couldn't find any formula that could make sense or exist for this compound. When we run it on the softer ionization technique, we figured out that this wasn't the mass of the compound, but, and we've been able to identify the mass. So imagine now, uh, like what, what we do, we run the sample first on this ionization technique, then we run it on this, and then we have to analyze each one separately, then we need to combine to figure out what the molecular ion of the compound is. But anyway, this helped us in identifying the compound that we, previously we had no information about. And also the softer ionization technique uh, was more sensitive and selective for halogenated or unknowns. And for that, we've been able to find more unknowns, like 67 more uh, halogenated unknowns. So here are some of the examples of the compounds we've been finding. So the first one is related to organochloropesticide, which are legacy contaminants, but it is a transformation form. Uh, the second is a compound uh, used in soap, and it is carcinogenic. We have another insecticide, and we have this compound which could explain why these contaminants are dangerous. Because carbazole itself, without these chlorine atoms, are a naturally occurring product. But it interacts with the other contaminants to give us halogenated carbazoles. And halogenated carbazoles are carcinogenic. They, are, uh, they affect the development, they uh, affect reproducibility, and they have the same effects as other legacy contaminants. Although the, the source was natural, but the interaction with the contaminants gave us something <coughs> dangerous. So as a conclusion, uh, by using non-targeted analysis, we've been able to detect new threats, also track the fate of the emerging contaminants, see if they transform in the environment, uh, if they fragment what we could get, and also monitor the quality of the ecosystem and the Great Lakes year by year. And as for future work, we started looking at non-halogenated contaminants as well, uh, we found a lot of pharmaceuticals, uh, compounds used in dyes, compounds used in uh, personal care products, and we know we're going to find even more. Uh, at the end, I would like to thank my advisor, Professor Fernando, and the other uh, professors working with us on this project, Professor Cremens, Professor Holson, Professor Hopke. Uh, my colleagues, of course, uh, and the EPA for funding the project, Clarkson University for giving me the opportunity to be part of this project, LECO for coming up with this nice instrument, and I would like to thank all of you for listening, and I'm up for questions.
So actually what we do is just when, like when you go to a doctor and first thing he need to do is figure out what the problem. So what we do is we discover the compounds, we uh, publish and other scientists who care about treatment will look at what's there because you cannot fight something that you don't know it exists. So actually this is what we do. Yeah. Is there a thing which you then try to write so based on you know, kind of the work that you've done in looking for ones that are more prevalent? Yes. And how do they compare to the legacy kind of relative scale, like to like the ones that you find in the non-targeted monsters that are not well known, very easy to use? Yeah. So the two questions. First, about concentration, we've been able to find semi quantitative concentrations it is not 100 percent sure be, uh, like accurate because uh you need standards for each compound in order to find the exact concentration so we've been able to estimate and because we also look at the legacy contaminants on in the same and like in the same uh, sample and estimated that as well so what we found is the concentration in general of the unknowns are higher than PCBs, higher than OCPs, and higher than PBDs. Like I show you in uh, the first slide, I don't know if I can come back. Yeah, here. Here is the known, the targeted compound, sorry. The targeted compound concentrations are the yellow one, while the unknowns that we found are the green ones. So you can see the difference. Uh, part of them, we think that they are fragmentation of PCBs. Because once, uh, when the PCBs concentration are going lower, they are increasing. But the second question is, most of the compound we found have no information about toxicity, about danger, about this stuff, because many of them were actually produced in the environment, like interaction of these contaminants with the environment giving us this. So we have so little information about, but they could be as dangerous, even more dangerous, and without knowing their danger, you can't set the limit, like this concentration is dangerous or not. So we have the concentration, but we don't know if it's safe or not. Yeah, there's so much gap. <laughs> It is. I know. Yeah, we use all like it's a whole fish. They homogenize it. Like we get 50 fish together, we homogenize it, and we use it as one sample, the whole fish. Uh, I'll leave your question for uh, my uh, colleague because he works on the targeted and in his presentation, he will represent how the trends of the uh, targeted compound is going. But it's definitely decreasing, but when it's in decreasing, that's what we were saying. They decrease, but other unknown stuff increase. So. That's what I look for exactly. <laughs>